It's September 4th, 1998, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. <laughs> On what date did the iconic TV quiz show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire make its debut, captivating audiences worldwide with its suspenseful gameplay and tantalising cash prizes? Was it A, 2001, B, 1995, C, 2005, or D, Today in History in 1998? <laughs> Rebecca, all your lifelines are still available. Would you like to ask the audience? <laughs> My heart was absolutely pounding. Even. You, did, you did that like an absolute expert. But you have hit upon the novel appeal of who wants to be a millionaire which as you mentioned made its debut on ITV today in history and will go on to the air another 592 episodes over 16 yeah, years yeah I rewatched this first episode and it's funny to see all of the pent up excitement in the room of people who just hadn't watched anything like this before and particularly I thought was amusing the fact it was the fact that like prizes in the thousands of pounds which now obviously get little to no reaction got huge applause like as people sailed through those very yeah. low price levels towards the million pounds, people were like, whoa, whoa, they've just hit 32,000. <laughs> yeah, it did seem an insane amount of money to be giving away in 1998. I mean, of course, they didn't get around to giving away a million pounds for quite some time, but they did give away 64 grand in this first show, which was a number that was chosen because of the $64,000 question. I mean, that's a number in game show history that people already had in their mind as the biggest amount of money you could previously win on television. So in episode one, they've just done that casually, like, oh, yeah, he's won 64 grand, and the audience go absolutely nuts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at that time, if you remember, most quiz shows actually awarded contestants in prizes like holidays or uh, electronics. You know, you might get a holiday to wherever with £1,000 of spending money, and that was considered the top prize. Mm. The big prize-winning show of the day before this was Wheel of Fortune, but the grand prize there was £20,000. Mm. That was as high stakes as it got. And of course, also in the UK, there is a tradition of quiz shows. You know, two of the most famous and long-running quiz shows, Mastermind and Uni Challenge, I've been on mm. both of them, don't <laughs> even have a prize except, you know, a trophy and the satisfaction of a quiz well quizzed. Which nerdy podcaster has appeared on both University Challenge and Mastermind? <laughs> I felt like if I didn't mention it, it was like I was being falsely modest. So I thought I'll just get out in front and address it. I like it. that the satisfaction that you won was the satisfaction of getting so close to winning as well, which admittedly is much closer to the top prize than I have ever got or would dare to get. So props to you. The show's <laughs> format in those early days was actually devised by three people, David Briggs, Mike Whitehill and Peaky Blinders writer Stephen Knight. The three yeah. of them were involved Involved in crafting a bunch of different uh, promotional games for Chris Tarrant's morning show on Capital FM radio, including the Bong game, which became uh, hugely popular. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire itself was based on an idea of basically a double your money radio quiz. And uh, it started with a stake of just a pound. And they had this idea that it would get progressively both more interesting and harder as it went along. It was initially called Cash Mountain. Uh, and when they first came up with it, they had in mind that there was no upper limit to the amount of the prize that you could possibly win, but they obviously couldn't get any uh, insurer to underwrite that. But I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Like the people who understand the mechanics of how this new format works understand that they're never going to give away more than a million pounds because it will become impossible to answer the question. It will be mathematically <laughs> impossible for someone to keep going forever. And yet, even an insurer whose job it is to look at the risk will say, but there's a yes. chance. And that's the that key someone to will it, isn't it? Win You're it thinking, infinity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're watching it thinking, well, but there's a chance someone could win a million pounds. I mean, it happens so yeah. rarely. And yet because there's a chance, it's just human instinct to just keep watching. <laughs> So Millionaire, under its original title of Cash Mountain, had been pitched all around town and no one had picked it up. It did come with a theme song, which I have to say, if you listen to it, it is hard to imagine anything that fits less with the eventual Who Wants to Be a Millionaire <laughs> aesthetic. It was written by Pete Waterman. Oh, it's fabulous. called Cloud Nine and it's bubblegum <laughs> pop. The lyrics sort of, the, the lyrics include, you take me under the rainbow and up to cloud nine. I'm flying high like a bird in the sky. <laughs> it's really, I mean... Pete Waterman could not have known how Millionaire was actually going to turn out, to be fair, when he was given this brief, but it is incredibly jarring. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because it is, you know, the high prize is obviously one of the elements that made it compelling, as we've said, and the playability, but also the high drama. Mm. You know, we'd seen both things before on the $64,000 question and Mastermind, respectively, but not in combination. 
you know, this is high drama because it actually matters. A lot of money is going to be going the way of the participant or they're going to lose a load of money. Um, and that then was reflected in the way that the music and the production was put together. But the way this actually came to British screens originally before it was an international hit was via ITV. The director of programmes there was David Lidamond. And the session at which Celador, that's the production company's um, MD, Paul Smith, pitched David Lidamond has kind of gone down in British <laughs> TV commissioning history, so I feel like we should reflect <laughs> it briefly. Um, because they had gone all around town with this before, as you said, Arian, and Claudia Rosencrantz, who I think was Liderman's deputy, she'd liked it but didn't have the power to commission it. And she'd been saying behind the scenes, let these guys come back and pitch you their quiz. It's great. Mm. And Paul Smith, knowing this was his one opportunity to really, you know, it, it, this was the last chance saloon for this format, went in with four envelopes stuffed with cash one with £250, one with £500, one with £1,000, and one with two grand. So he took, you know, nearly £4,000 of his own money to a meeting with ITV (laughs) and then got David Liderman to make up the remainder so that they had the largest amount of cash prize available with his own money that he was playing for. And they played a round of who wants to be a millionaire in the office and demonstrated that the main concern that ITV had had before, which was... How is there any suspense if it's multiple choice and you see the answers in advance before you decide if you play? That was mitigated. Yeah. Because in theory, okay, see the question and then decide do you want to play. But once you've seen the answers, you know if you know it or yeah. not. Yeah. But when you're in the room and you're gambling your own money, it's a very different yeah. flavor. And on the spot, Liderman then finally commissioned it. And the stroke of genius did so over 10 consecutive nights, which really helped build the audience and turn this into a massive event. I mean, I remember this being on. Yeah, and that sense of suspense in conjunction with the fact that the answers are staring you straight in the face, I think was what led to this being such an enormous hit. Because sitting at home, you could both kind of think, well, I, I kind of know that one, or there's the answer that I'm going to lock in. And so you could do a sort of play along thing, but simultaneously knowing what it would be like to sit in the studio and have to face that same decision got you into their headspace and really ramped up that tension. And, you know, it was an enormous hit. At its peak, it was getting 19 million viewers in the UK, which is about one in three members of the British population. It then spread all over the world. It became a ratings topper in more than 50 countries, including the US, Japan, India, Australia, everywhere. It turned around ABC. Yeah, totally. And at its peak, half of the countries in the world were familiar with the phrases phone a friend 50-50 and ask the audience. So it was just this huge worldwide hit. And one huge aspect of Millionaire's appeal was the aesthetic. So the set was created by former theatre set designer Andy Wormsley, who had the fateful suggestion, why don't we do it in the round like a coliseum that will mm. add drama, which it did. Also adding drama with the show's theme music and incidental music, composed by father and son Keith and Michael Strachan. Fun fact about Keith, he co-wrote Cliff Richard's 1988 Christmas number one, Mistletoe and Wine, originally written by him for a musical adaptation of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Match Girl. <laughs> Those are two bangers. Yeah. I would, if I wrote Mistletoe and Wine and the theme to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, I would die yeah. happy. <laughs> and the Strackens were brought in towards the end of production. That This was when they decided that Pete Waterman's Cloud Nine was no longer going to fit the dark and moody look they were going for. They composed 95 snippets of music. It was meticulously thought out to amp up the tension. You don't necessarily notice it consciously when you're watching but when the contestant goes through the questions the music rises in pitch by a semitone with each Mm. question so it's building up you know it's more like a thriller than a game show and i think that speaks to david briggs's radio background yeah yeah that's the sort of thing that they do on a radio breakfast show because you haven't got the visual elements to play with and smith insisted that one of the things that had to go with the production when it went around the world was that producers were forbidden from hiring local composers to create original music they had to use the same uh, music cues as the British version. You also had to have the same lighting system and set design completely faithfully uh, reproduced the way that the UK one had them. And you also had all hosts wearing Armani suits because that's what Tarrant wore (laughs) in the UK. (laughs) I watched this first episode today and here are my observations of how you know it's 1998. (laughs) Uh, One... It starts with Chris Tarrant not bigging up the prize, but with a joke at the expense of Monica Lewinsky. Yeah, I found that very (laughs) weird. (laughs) This is, I mean, he says, this is the opening line on 
you know, this historic quiz show. Everyone wants to be a millionaire these days. Monica Lewinsky is getting millions of dollars to write her tell-all memoirs. Let's hope it's not a pop-up yeah, book. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's thing one. Uh, number two, there is the visualisation of what one million pounds looks like Ooh, in 50-pound yes, notes. Yeah. It's, there's a transparent briefcase with fake 50s in it. It's sitting between them, isn't it? Yeah, it's at, at their yeah. knees. <laughs> And then the bit that really sort of brought it home to me that we're in the 90s is the moment that the first ever contestant, Graham, uses the phone-a-friend lifeline. He calls his granddad, and an actual prop phone is produced <laughs> from the chair. Like, because even though you know watching at home that he's obviously speaking over the PA system, yeah. it needed to be visually demonstrated with a piece of plastic that they hold next to their ears so that everyone, under- everyone understood at home they are talking on a phone. He is phoning someone. Yeah, it might as well have been fax-a-friend, you know, to... Yeah. <laughs> Emphasize where we were in history. <laughs> Tomorrow. Shops were boarded up, the high school had been condemned, the mayor was the janitor of the hospital. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash retrospectors.